We now come to the preaching of the Word of God from Ecclesiastes, uh, chapter 2. We're going to Ecclesiastes, chapter 2, picking up in verses 12 to 17. I've been working very slowly through the book of Ecclesiastes whenever I come here. Uh, I believe this is the fourth or fifth message in Ecclesiastes, and we've arrived at verse 12, uh, going to verse 17, and the title for the message is, Therefore I Hated My Life. And so now let us listen to the Word of God from Ecclesiastes 2, verses 12 to 17. And I turned myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do that cometh after the king? even that which hath been already done. Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly as far as light excelleth darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happeneth to them all. Then said I in my heart, as it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever, seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man as the fool? Therefore I hated life because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me. For all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Well, after some deep reflection and consideration uh, of, of Solomon upon the world and upon his own life in this book and upon all the toil that men do under the sun, Solomon has already expressed some sorrow at even having wisdom because it's been so grievous to him to look upon these things and see such corruption, such ruin and decay upon everything in the world. And he said, therefore, it was a sorrow for me to be wise. It was a sorrow for him to be wise. Uh, we've, We've covered this already. He's had more grief because of this. He said that men work and they build. It's always subject to decay. And no one will even remember most of the things that men build. It's all pointless in Solomon's eyes from this perspective. Uh, In in fact, another way to put it, Solomon said this in chapter 1, that which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. And so he's saying that the extent and the magnitude of the world's corruption, and therefore what's uh, it's it's working everything to vanity, it's beyond, beyond comprehension, no one can count it, no one can number it, and the world is so deeply broken And Solomon says he can't do anything about it. He's applied himself in every way to try to work a way out of it. And again, remember, uh, he's he's looking at everything from a certain perspective, from being under the sun. And so he's putting on those shoes as being uh, just looking at the world uh, in a horizontal way, on a surface level. He says it's so deeply broken. And so what he sees, he says it's like knowing that there's a foundation that's been made for a house, but it's it's broken. It's ruined. Part of it sunk down. It's uneven. It's like, that's the world. And there's no way to repair it. It's, it's hopelessly broken. And then he looks and he sees, and he says, it's like men are trying to build up a house on that foundation anyway. And just saying, it won't matter. We'll just go ahead and build on it anyway. But anyone who has any sense would know it's not going to stand. And so he says, men are deluding themselves everywhere. And he says, even he did the same thing. And he taught, he spoke about, uh, many different, uh, many different experiments that he conducted of trying to build up on that foundation. And he said he tried and tested all kinds of things. Well, now in, in chapter two, Solomon's going to switch into a bit of a teaching mode and he's going to reveal something that in this life, in this world, there is a limited benefit to being wise. So wisdom actually does excel folly in this world. And he's going to say there is a benefit, 
but only up to a point. And so as we look at this passage in chapter 2, uh, we'll do it under three headings. First, there's going to be another experiment. As Solomon has done previous experiments, he's going to do another experiment. And then secondly, he's going to show there is a limited advantage to wisdom. That to a point, there is a, an advantage to wisdom in this life. But then, in the third heading, he's going to undo that. He's going to remove that advantage and show why that also is vanity as well. So Solomon is bringing some challenging truths to us here. And with the Lord's help, we'll, we'll see the full weight of what he's saying. And, we'll, and we'll, we will, with the Lord's help, come to the same conclusion. And with the Lord's blessing, it'll drive us to Christ. It'll drive us to Christ again. So be, be, we begin here in verse 12. This is another experiment. In verse 12, Solomon says he gives himself to know wisdom and folly and madness. It says, and I turn myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do that cometh after the king? So Solomon has already said it's a, it's a sorrow for him to, we, to be wise. It's a grief to him to have understanding of these things. And so now to be very thorough, he's going to take another look at things, and now he's going to consider madness and folly again. And he's going to say, in doing this, he's saying, maybe there's an advantage to going down the path of the fool. Maybe in a counterintuitive way, there's something that a fool knows that other people don't know. And so he's going to go down that path. Maybe the psychopath has something that, that no one else knows. So he's, he's already said that he's been sick of pleasure. He's tried pleasure. And he says that's just made him sick. He said that he's been grieved by wisdom. And so now he's going to give greater consideration to foolishness and madness. You could maybe compare this to somebody in life who just gives up. They just throw away their potential. And there's a number of reasons why someone might do that, but people do this. They just throw away their potential, and they just live life as a fool on purpose, intentionally. Maybe you know someone who's done that. There are people who do that who do that in this world. They live like fools, even though they don't need to. They, they do it intentionally because maybe they're afraid to apply themselves. Maybe they're, they're afraid of what will happen if they utilize their gifts and their potential, and then that will bring responsibility that they don't want. And so they intentionally live like a fool. Now, I don't want to pile on to the homeless, but there there have been these cities that have tried this. They found out when they help the homeless, when, when they get homeless into free housing, and they even provide homeless people with uh, income, and all they, all they say is, is a, a little bit of responsibility and, and, you know, show up at the right appointments and everything, that certain homeless just run away from it. They, they, they don't want anything to do with it. They don't want anyone telling them that you have to be here at this time or you have to be here at that time. And so this has been tested and, and it's shown to be true that some people, that the thought of having any responsibility at all is debilitating for them. And so they just run away from it. And some people are like this. And now Solomon is going to test this. He's going to see if there's a counterintuitive reason for uh, for this. And so maybe people that we look at like they're a sponge, they actually know something that we don't. And they're actually uh, in, a some, in some way wiser than we are or than Solomon is. And so he's going to see about it. Maybe the Epicureans were right. Do you know about the, about the Epicureans uh, back in Rome? The Epicureans had a philosophy that you should try to live for pleasure in such a way that you're avoiding pain. You should try to maximize your enjoyment, maximize your pleasure, and take only the smallest responsibilities that you can just to keep yourself out of uh, consequences and pain. And that is a way to live a, a really fulfilling life, according to the Epicureans. Or maybe the Taoists, maybe they're right. Uh, if you know about the Taoists from uh, Chinese history, Lao Tzu and the Taoists, uh, he would say, just go with the flow. Live like you're a leaf that's just blown around by the wind or going down a stream. Don't go against it. Uh, don't strive. Don't uh, worry about, about meeting your potential. Don't worry about education or ambitions. Just live simply. 
and just go with the flow and live like a, a happy clam or something, maybe the Taoists are right. And so Solomon is putting this to the tests. And he's, he's saying, maybe they're right. I'm going to find out. And he makes a point here about being very thorough in this. He wants to, he wants to really be thorough by asking this rhetorical question. He says in verse 12, what can the man do that cometh after the king? So this isn't talking about his son, or it's not talking about maybe another man that's going to be king after Solomon, but he's putting this out there rhetorically to talk about any man that would come after him, meaning in, a, in importance and in, in gifts and ability, any lesser man. And so the question is like this. If I, the king, have expended all my resources and applied all my, my wisdom in, in testing out all of these things, whether it's pleasure uh, whether it's relationships, whether it's wisdom, or whether it's folly or madness, if I have expended my resources in all of this, what can any lesser man than I hope to conclude other than what I've, what I've already concluded myself? And that's what he says. He says, this is his answer. He says, what can any man that cometh after the king do? He says, even that which hath already been done. In other words, He's not going to find out anything different. He's not going to discover anything. He's not going to unlock anything that the king has not unlocked himself. And so what is Solomon doing? He's, he's beating the very same drum that he has been in this entire book so far, and he will do. He's beating the same drum, sounding the same note, saying, don't kid yourself. Don't think that you are going to be crafty enough or wise enough to figure out some hidden way and unlock some hidden way to have this, this life that is fulfilling and satisfying under the sun. And that you're going to discover something that nobody else has. You know, maybe there's some young people that think like that. I'm going to find a way of living, a way, a way to lead my life in such a way that I'm going to be satisfied and fulfilled on my own. I'm going to do it my own way. It's not going to happen. Solomon is, is, uh, bringing this to us, he's bringing this home to us very hard. He's saying it's not going to happen. People are not going to unlock some secret to living this fulfilled and satisfying life on their own under the sun. Nothing's just going to revolutionize life under the sun. Nothing's just going to overhaul it and then suddenly make it not frustrating and, and not subject to vanity. Nothing's going to actually address the trauma of sin and of unbelief in the heart. Nothing. Uh, going back again to the words of chapter 1, that which is crooked cannot be made straight. And that which is wanting cannot be numbered. And so Solomon is saying in this test, everything has been tried. There's nothing new under the sun. There's no human innovation or technological advance that's going to come and rescue humanity from the effects of sin and the deep trauma of sin in the heart and unbelief. And so he's saying, don't kid yourself. Face up to it. Confront it. That everything in this world, everything under the sun, is, is ruined by frustration and vanity because of sin. And so Solomon has said this before. He's saying it to us again. But then he's going to build on that a little bit. In our second heading, he is going to say there's a limited advantage to being wise. So in this world of frustration and, and folly, there is a limited advantage to having wisdom. He'll say this in verse 13. Then I saw, once he did that experiment, then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly as far as light excelleth darkness. So the, the experiment is done and he says, there is a very good benefit in this life in having wisdom. And he says, as far as light excelleth darkness, it's better to be wise than to be foolish. Now, boys and girls, maybe you've had to walk through your house in the, in the nighttime, in the dark, and maybe walk through a room and it's got tables and chairs and uh, it's got furniture in the room in the dark. Now, Maybe you've actually hit your foot against one of these things, against one of these pieces of furniture, and it hurts really, really bad. And so which would be better to walk through that room 
in the total darkness or to have just a little light, uh, just maybe a little flashlight or just a nightlight or something. Obviously, it's so much better to have a little bit of light in that room. And this is what Solomon is saying. That's how much better it is to be wise than it is to be a fool. You're going to protect yourself. You're going to safeguard yourself. And he says, wisdom is what in this world allows a man to see things that fools cannot see. Uh, And this is going back to what we read earlier in the book of Proverbs. It's allowing a man to see things that he could not see if he were a fool. And so that's why Solomon says here in verse 14 about the wise man, his eyes are in his head. And so in other words, boys and girls, that means his eyes are where they are supposed to be. And they are doing what they are supposed to do. And they're helping him. And he's using them to perceive things in this world that will be, uh, that will be dangerous for him. And he's avoiding it. And so it's like, it's like saying something about a person, you know, they have a good head on their shoulders. Well, what does that mean? It means that their head is where it's supposed to be. And they're using it for what they're supposed to be using it for. And so that's what Solomon is saying about wisdom. There's something good about wisdom in this world because a man is using his eyes the way that he's supposed to use them in this world, and and he's able to go into situation uh, with his eyes open and perceive things. The wise man, he's able to understand things and notice things, and he's thinking ahead, and he's not caught by surprise. That's a hallmark of the wise man in Scripture, in the book of Proverbs. He's not really caught by surprise as others are because he's always learning. He's always growing, and he's building upon, upon his understanding. And he's not repeating the same mistakes over and over and over because he's taking responsibility and he's growing and he's learning. And that's what it means when Solomon says he's got his eyes in his head. But what about the fool? The fool, on the other hand, is walking in darkness. Solomon says he might as well be blind in this world as he's walking through the world. Uh, Again, it's like what we read in Proverbs 17 where it says the eyes of the fool are at the ends of the earth looking at everything else other than what he needs to be looking at, what's right in front of him, uh, what, what affects him the most. You see, the fool, he stumbles his way through life. He doesn't know what's going on. He's like walking through that, that room with all that furniture in it in just the darkness. And so, of course, he's going to hit his foot against that chair or that, that table. And, of course, he's going to get hurt. And instead of, instead of looking to himself... He's just going to curse the darkness. He's going to look at anything else other than himself. He's just going to shift responsibility and and blame anything else other than himself. That's the hallmark of the fool. Remember, uh, a word of reproof will go into the heart of a wise man more than 100 stripes into a fool. That's 100 whips on the back of a fool. It won't change him. So you see, the fool is blind, stumbling through the world uh, from one thing to another, not understanding why things keep on happening to him, never looking within and never saying, oh, it might be my fault, but it's always everything else. And then, and then disaster comes to the fool. And one feature of the fool that you'll see in Scripture every time, disaster comes to the fool, and he never saw it coming. It's a total surprise to him. And he'll wonder, why did that happen? Not even knowing it was his own doing. It was his own, his own habits that led up to it. And so Solomon is, is putting this in front of us. He's saying there is a great benefit in this world to being wise. You will save yourself from so many hardships and so many unnecessary troubles if you're wise in this world. And so it does excel fo- folly as light excelleth darkness. And there is a benefit. The Bible speaks to us very much about the blessing of being wise in the book of Proverbs. We could turn to many of these. I'll just highlight a few here. Uh, Proverbs 10, 21. The lips of the righteous feed many, but the, but the fool dies for want of wisdom. And so it's a blessing to be wise and be able to help people, but the fool just dies because they can't figure it out. Proverbs 15.10, correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. 
And again, this is a fool that hates to be corrected. And so what's going to happen to him? He's going to die. And he's never going to take responsibility. He's never going to think it's his fault because he won't take correction. And so he's going to die. And then Proverbs 19.3, The foolishness of man perverteth his way, and his heart fretteth against the Lord. And so there's something, uh, there's something broken and wrong in the heart of the fool that's just leading him into trouble, leading him into disaster, um, leading him into things which are not good for him. That's what it means when it says it perverteth his way. It's like his heart is a compass and the compass is broken and it's always pointing to something that's going to hurt him. And he doesn't know it. And so he's just going to keep on going into it and it's going to keep on hurting him. And instead of ever stopping and, and saying, what's wrong with me? It says his heart is going to fret against the Lord. And he's going to curse the Lord and say, the Lord doesn't give me the things that I need when what he really needs is, is right in front of him. If he had eyes in his, in his head to see this. And so foolishness and immorality are great evils and they ruin people and they ruin nations. And you see, God has set up the world with a certain order in it that's after his own wisdom. And so those that are wise in the world are able to uh, walk through the world in a way that is, is so much safer and, and so much more positive and beneficial in so many ways than the fool. The fool just is always butting up against God's order and God's ways. They're just butting up against it and they're cursing their, their trouble all the time. And so if people could learn, they, they could gain something, they could gain an amount of worldly wisdom, they might save themselves from so many sorrows that they would otherwise experience. Well, is this saying that wisdom is the cure-all? Wisdom is the panacea. Is this saying that if you just have wisdom, then all is well for you? Remember, we said that, that wisdom excelleth folly as light excelleth the darkness, but up to a point. There's a limited benefit to wisdom in this world. And Solomon is going to come to something that's very disturbing. When he, when he brings it out, it's, it's actually disturbing him, and it should disturb us. That there's a greater evil. There's a greater evil that removes this benefit. That this benefit is, is only for a limited time. Because we come to the third heading, the advantage removed. Verse 14. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happeneth to them all. What's he talking about? The final event that happens to any of us in this world is death. Whether a wise or fool, he says, one event happeneth to them all, the appointed time of our death, which in some sense, in some way, death makes every man equal with every other man. If you're looking at it from a perspective of under the sun and from a perspective of, of this world only, death makes us all equal. And he's going to meditate on these things. He's going, Solomon's going to meditate on this and he's going to become more and more disturbed because it's true. Uh, verse 15, Then said I in my heart, As it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart that this also is vanity. And so, again, he's saying, in a sense, looking at it from a worldly perspective, death makes us all equal. And so go back to that illustration, boys and girls, of walking through that room, uh, walking through that room that's filled with furniture, whether you would do it with no lights on and you would hit your foot against everything in the room, or whether you would do it with some light on, and then you would be able to make it through that room without hitting your foot? Well, Solomon is saying, what's at the other side of the room? It's darkness for everyone. It's darkness for all. When death comes. And so what's the advantage? What is the real advantage? He says, why was I more wise? Death is going to make, uh, make us all equal. When you're looking at it from a perspective of under the sun, you have to admit that death is just as wise, or sorry, death is just as dark 
as it is for the wise and it is for the foolish. If you look out at a cemetery, at a graveyard, you don't know who was wise and who was foolish. They're all the same. You know, Job, he mentions this as well uh, when he's in despair. He says in Job chapter 10, I go whence I shall not return, even to the land of darkness and to the shadow of death, a land of darkness as darkness itself, and the shadow of death without any order, and where the light is as darkness. And so Job, looking at it, looking at his end, in despair, he's, he's speaking a little bit like Solomon, saying from the point of view of, of the world, it's darkness. It's great darkness for everyone. And so you begin to understand why, why Solomon is becoming disturbed and why he questions what's the point of even being wise and why he calls all of it a vanity and a vexation of spirit. He goes on in verse 16, For there is no remembrance of the wise man more than the fool forever, seeing that which is now in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man as the fool? So even if people are remembered after their death in this world for a short time, they will be forgotten. Even if people are remembered for a short time, their memory lives on in in the hearts of those that, that knew them. It's all subject to decay. It's all going to fade. Whether it's 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, it's going to fade. The greatest men on the earth, their monuments, they're all going to fade. The pyramids are already on their way to crumbling, and they will crumble. Uh, it's all going to fade. It's all subject to decay. It's not going to last. This is what Solomon's saying. It's all going to be forgotten. Solomon's looking at things from the perspective of this world and life under the sun, and he's saying it's all going to be forgotten. There's an old French saying. It says that every piece of glass is destined to be broken. There's not a single piece of glass that could ever be made that's not going to end up broken. All of them will. And so this is like our remembrance. This is like our memory. It's going to be forgotten. And Solomon is, is highlighting for that, uh, highlighting that for us. It's going to be, it's going to dim, it's going to fade, and it's going to disappear from off the earth. And so he's saying, what's the benefit? It was only up to a certain point, and now it's gone. And then he brings it, he brings it to the, uh, he brings it to the ultimate statement right here. He says, how dieth the wise man as the fool? You see, the wise man for all his wisdom is not wise enough not to die. For all his wisdom, he was not able to figure out how to sidestep death. And so in that sense, he dies as the fool. He dies the same death as the fool. Many have come to this realization uh, late in their life. Uh, there have been thinkers, uh, philosophers, leaders in this world who have uh, dedicated their lives to wisdom and dedicated their lives to helping others. But they have said when they're faced with their own death, what did it matter all that I did if I still must die? I still must die. And so they realize that death is making a fool of them. That no matter how wise they were in this world, they still have to die. They can't get out of that one. And so in that way, the wise man dieth as the fool. There's no neat trick. There's no wisdom. There's no clever way to get out of death. It's appointed to all men once to die. And then comes the judgment. So Solomon's disturbed by these things. Verse 17, Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the, under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. And so here's Solomon's summary statement of what he's teaching. He's teaching that death makes fools of us all, that there is a limited, there is a limited benefit to wisdom in this world, but then it's removed. And he's saying, I hated life. Now, life is a good gift. God gave us life as a gift. Life is precious. And life is worth preserving. And in fact, if you study the, the, the sixth commandment, you'll see that 
It's a duty for us to preserve our life. It's a, it's a duty for us to preserve others' life. And so in that way, we would not say we hate life. So Solomon is not saying that he hates his natural life. He's not saying he hates his physical life. But he's saying he hates the frustration of life. He hates the, uh, the emptiness of life. In light of all these things, if you're looking at it from this world only, how could you not hate life? How could you not hate the frustration of it, all the waste of it? Because of sin and because of death, how could you not hate it? It's not going anywhere. It's not leading to anything. It's not building up anything that's going to last when you're looking at it from the point of view of this world. And so this is what Solomon has has reached uh, as, a, as a teaching for us. And I've, I've said this to you before in this book. I'll say it to you again. Trying to, trying to use this life in such a way as to, gr- as to bring out anything that's lasting, anything that's solid, uh, joy or meaning it is, is foolishness. It's not there. And Solomon is reminding of, uh, re- reminding of us of, uh, of this. We need to have this in our minds. Uh, it's not going to be in this world that we find any of these things, no matter how hard people try. Well, we've gone along with Solomon on this other, this another experiment, and the result has been the same as some of his others. Even though wisdom has a limited benefit in life, it's fleeting, and death is going to take it right away. But let's think on that for a moment in our application here. So there is benefit in this life in being wise according to the world. Solomon acknowledges it. We can all acknowledge it. There is benefit. And in fact, it exceeds being foolish as light, as light excels darkness. But bringing it to another level, what about spiritual wisdom? So if being worldly in your wisdom is so much better than being foolish in this world, what about spiritual wisdom? How much does that excel anything? How much is that, uh, how, how much is that superior to anything? Spiritual wisdom and spiritual sight. The kind that the Lord Jesus Christ was talking about when he, when he gave all of his teachings, uh, what we read in Luke chapter 14, all the things that he was bringing to us that were about spiritual wisdom and about knowing the Lord and about finding uh, finding joy and, sp- and satisfaction in the Lord above anything. We need spiritual wisdom. We need spiritual sight to see Christ, to believe in the gospel, if we're able to walk on the path to God's heavenly kingdom, to that, the, to that which will last. And so as light excelleth darkness, so does worldly wisdom excel folly. But how much more is spiritual wisdom excelling both of them if we could know Christ, and if we could have a purpose that is extending beyond this world only. That is, that is real wisdom. That is real wisdom. Solomon has to admit that the same end comes upon all, and it, and it disturbs him. He says that death is going to make, in some sense, all men equal, and it disturbs him. And he says he hates his life. Well, if this was a feel-good message and I was a motivational speaker, I would be asking you, do you hate your life? Well, don't hate your life. Look on the bright side. Find the positive. That's no way to live. Don't hate your life. If I was a motivational speaker, I'm not a motivational speaker. I'm coming to you with a word of wisdom from God's word. It's not a feel-good message. And so the application is, yes, hate your life so that you will leave it behind and you'll lose it. Hate your life because it's not worth loving because of all the frustration and all the vanity and the sin and and, and the unbelief that's been revealed to us. Go ahead and hate your life just as Christ says, hate your life. In Luke 14, he says, if any man cometh to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. And so you see how Solomon was at the beginning of that. And the the fullness of that 
is reaching forth to Christ and saying, I do hate my life. I do hate all the vanity. I hate the frustration. It's not getting me anywhere. I'm spinning my wheels. I'm like a fool. I'm just destroying myself. If I just look to this life only and cling to this life only, I'm a fool. And so hate it so that you would go to Christ, so that you would cling to Him, and so that you would say, Christ is my life. And I look ahead to everything that Christ has promised for me. And I want to serve Him. I don't, I'm not worried about trying to preserve my own life. I'm not trying to do like, uh, philosophers and the Epicureans and the, and the Taoists and, and trying to come up with some system that I can maximize the enjoyment of my life. Where I can, uh, somehow avoid whatever consequences I can so that I can just have the best life that I can have in this world. I'm not gonna do that. In fact, I'm going to lose it all. I'm going to just despise it so that I can have the life that Christ gives. And you see, that's counterintuitive. That's counterintuitive to the flesh because the flesh loves this life. Christ says it like this in the book of John. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. And that's counterintuitive. That is counterintuitive to the flesh. The flesh will scream against that. The flesh will continue to try to search through the the garbage heaps of this world, just trying to find that which will, will satisfy it. But those that are spiritually wise, who have been given eyes to see, isn't that what Christ says? Luke 14, at the end he says, uh, eyes to see and ears to hear. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear it. Those that have been given ears to hear, eyes to see, they'll say, they'll say, uh, I despise this life and the frustration of sin. And my heart's contentment and my joy is in following Christ and serving Christ. You'll, you'll be like Paul. Paul says it in Galatians 2.20, a very familiar verse. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says, I'm crucified. Counterintuitive to the flesh. He took his, his sin in his flesh and he said, Crucify it. I want to be done with it. Now, yes, it still clings on to us. We still have to walk through this world in this, this, uh, manner of, of having sin present within us, clinging on to us. But he says, I hate it. I'm not trying to foster it. I'm not trying to, to feed the desires of this world. I hate it. Too many people are still in love with this world or too many people are just riding the fence between wanting to serve Christ totally and still wanting the, the promises of the world. And so it's like they have their, their foot in both, on both sides. Too many people are like that and not, and not despising the so-called pleasures of the world and, and going to Christ fully. I'll, I'll leave you with this. This is what Christ says in John. Verily, verily, I say to you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. What is Christ talking about? It's the same as some of the other statements he's he's made. You have to die. Now, all of us will die. All of you will die. But how will you die? Will you die as a fool dieth? So like Solomon was saying, will you die as a fool? Will you live your whole life for the things of this world? Maybe trying to be as wise as you can be in this world, but yet reach the end of your life and say, what did it matter? I've wasted it all. I can't avoid death. And now I'm going to die as a fool. Or will you do what Christ says? Christ says, die right now. Die today. 
as a seed dies. Not as a fool dies, but as a seed dies. And how does a seed die, boys and girls? How does a seed die? Well, it goes down in the ground. But then it brings forth fruit. Then it lives. That's what's, what Christ is saying, that we would despise the life that we have in this world, the frustration of it, and then die by, by despising it and loving Christ. And then he says, then you shall bring forth fruit. Then you shall have life unto life eternal. How will you die? As a fool dieth or as a seed? May the Lord bless his word to all of us. Would you stand now together as we pray to our God?